All right, we're going to look at another example of a double integral. And so we're going to have to look at our function and our region and decide whether we would like to do this integral with dx on the inner integral, dy on the inner integral, or maybe convert to polar coordinates. So if we look at the function, uh, you should notice that that function is very difficult to integrate with respect to x or y. It would require trig substitution. Not impossible, but not super easy to do either. Uh, but if you convert to polar coordinates, you can use x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This denominator simplifies very nicely. Remember, you get an extra r in your dA. But you end up with a pretty straightforward function to integrate. So the function works very nicely in polar coordinates. You need to also think about the region and think about whether our region is x simple, y simple, r simple, theta simple, et cetera. Uh, this region, just want to make sure that you understand what we're looking at here. So I've got my x and y axes here. And then we've got this circle, which is not centered at the origin. So looking at that equation of the circle, the center is at 1, 0. And the radius of the circle is 1. We've got this line at x equals 1. And so this is our region over here. Um, so this region, if my circle were centered at the origin, the region would be screaming polar coordinates at you. With this region not centered at the origin, we might have to think a little bit more about that. Our region here is x simple. If I think about going through the region in the direction of increasing x, I always enter at this line x equals 1 and I leave through the right half of this circle. I can solve that equation for x to have that. It is also y simple. So if I go through the region in the direction of increasing y, I always enter through this line along the bottom and I leave through the top half of that circle. So the region is both x simple and y simple. And the conversion to polar coordinates for these equations is not as easy as some of the other examples we've looked at. So let's go ahead and convert these, though, to polar coordinates, since this function is so much nicer in polar coordinates. I'm going to go ahead and convert these equations to polar coordinates, and we'll talk about thinking about whether this whole problem would be better done in polar coordinates than not. Um, so if our circle was, were centered at the origin, we could uh, just use the definition of what R stands for and write that. Um, but here, we've got to do a little bit of work converting that to polar coordinates. We did a problem actually like this at the very beginning of the semester in the review content that we did in week one. And so I think you were given the equation of a circle in a slightly different form, asked to complete the square to put it in this form, identify the center and radius, and then also convert the equation to polar coordinates. And many of you noticed that it was actually easier to convert to polar coordinates if you had it in the other form before it was in this completed the square form. So I'm going to do a little bit of scratch work down here for that. And I'm going to go ahead and put this kind of out in expanded form. So I'm going to expand out the x minus 1, the quantity squared. We'll have x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then I'll have plus y squared equals 1. Uh, so I can subtract 1 from both sides. I might go ahead and add 2x to both sides of the equation. Or I could write, maybe I'll just leave all the variables on one side, but sort of rearrange them. OK, so uh, this is the form the equation you were given on that review material was in. Uh, and you were asked to convert that to polar coordinates. So different people did that differently. But x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And then x is our cosine theta. Um, so you can, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, some of you divided through by r. Um, that loses r equals 0. For this region, that's OK, because r equals 0 is here. And we're interested in this region over here. Um, a better strategy often than dividing through by a variable is to factor that variable out and set each factor equal to 0. And when I set this factor equal to 0, I can add 2 cosine theta to both sides, and I get this equation. So r equals 0 is at the origin. This equation is the whole circle and actually does include the origin. So really, this is all I need. This r equals 0 is an extraneous equation. All right, so r equals 2 cosine theta is the equation for this circle in polar coordinates. So not quite as simple as r equals a constant, but not too terrible bad either. 
Uh, the other equation I need to convert to polar coordinates is x equals 1, this vertical line. Um, so when I convert that to polar coordinates, I'm going to use x equals, let's just go over here, x equals r cosine theta equals 1. And then uh, I probably am going to want this in uh, solve for r or solve for theta in order to set up my integral. Um, so I'm going to wait to solve that for r or theta until we think about setting up this integral here. All right, so let's go ahead and set this up in polar coordinates. Again, the equations are not quite as simple as the other examples we looked at, but this function that we're integrating is much easier to integrate in polar coordinates than rectangular coordinates. So we have x squared plus y squared is r squared, and then we have that quantity squared. So we'll have r to the fourth on the denominator there. Remember, we have the extra r from our r dr d theta or d theta dr. And then I need to think about the order in which I want to do the integration. So I need to think about going through the region in the direction of increasing r or increasing theta and thinking about if the region is r simple or theta simple. Most of the regions we've looked at so far are both. They've been polar rectangles, and so they are both r simple and theta simple. This one is not both. It's only one or the other. So you want to think about polar graph paper, those grid lines along polar graph paper, that helps you visualize constant values of r and constant values of theta. And so I don't have this on grid paper here, but just thinking about it, x equals 1 here, and then this point up here, if my circle is radius 1, this point would be here at 1, 1, and then 2. And so my constant radii would look like this. And maybe I'll put one part way between there. And then my constant values of theta would be my angles. And so there's a pi over 4, 1. OK, so when I do that, you can maybe see that when I go through the region in the direction of increasing theta, I sometimes enter and leave through different curves. So this region is not theta simple. It is r simple. To think about theta simple, I'm just going to get a fixed value of r. I'm just going to pick a fixed value of r about right here and go through parallel to my little grid lines here through that region in the direction of increasing theta. So I've entered here at theta equals 0, and here I've left through the line. But over here, when I go through that region in the direction of increasing theta, I've entered at theta equals 0, but I've left through the edge of that circle. So this region is not theta simple. This is a harder one than some we've looked at. Uh, this region is r simple, though. If I start at r equals 0 and I go outward from the origin, so pi over 4 would be right here. It would go through that vertex point. But all of these other constant theta values going through the region in the direction of increasing r along constant theta values, I'm always entering along the line x equals 1 or r cosine theta equals 1. And I'm always leaving through that circle, r equals 2 cosine theta. So this region is r simple. So I'm going to set this up with r on the inner integral, which means I want to solve this equation for r. In order to do that, we're going to have to divide through by cosine theta. So that might alarm you a little bit, because you want to be careful about dividing by things that could be 0. Cosine theta is 0 when theta equals pi over 2, which is this point on the curve, cosine on the circle. So we're way over here. So actually, the theta values that we will be in as we're in that region is just theta from 0 to pi over 2. So this is OK. So you should be alarmed by that, but you should be able to verify by this picture that we're OK on the region we're on, because cosine theta is never 0 on that region. All right, so let's go ahead and set up our integration. We decided that the region is not theta simple, but it is r simple, so I want to do dr on my inner integral. I want to think about as I go through the region in the direction of increasing r, I'm entering at this line, which is r equals 1 over cosine theta, or I can rewrite that as r equals secant theta. Uh, and I leave through the equation of the circle, r equals 2 cosine theta. And then I need to do my d theta limits of integration. So as I sweep through this region, or you can also think about this. Remember when we did x, y, we thought about projecting back, collapsing back onto the x-axis or y-axis. 
There's not really a theta axis in polar coordinates to think about, but you can think about minimum theta value to maximum theta value as you go through that region. So the initial theta value as we start that region is at theta equals zero, and then the last theta value we hit as we sweep through that region is here at theta equals pi over four. You maybe can do some algebra or just think about the geometry of this to think about the fact that this is a 45 degree angle here. Um, so uh, theta will go from zero to pi over four. Okay, so now I want to do this integration. The first step would be to do that simplification. So I have some r's here that cancel, so I end up with one over r cubed, or if I'm gonna go ahead and do the integration, maybe I want to think about that as r to the negative three. Um, notice again, over and over again, I'm writing these outer integration symbols and the differential in every step. Even though I'm not doing anything with them, they should not disappear and reappear later in the problem. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and find this antiderivative. So I'll add one and divide by that number, r to the negative 2 over negative 2 from secant theta to 2 cosine theta. I'm going to plug in those limits of integration, and I probably want to do some simplifying with that as I do that because I'm going to need to do another integration here. Um, so this is negative 1 over 2r squared, if I rewrite this as a, without a negative exponent. So when I plug this in for r, I'll have negative 1 over 2, and then my r is 2 cosine theta squared, so negative 1 over 2r squared, uh, and then minus negative 1 over 2 times secant theta squared. Okay, and that looks like it's kind of difficult to integrate, but if you actually do this simplification, it turns uh, pretty straightforward, so I'm going to skip a couple steps here, but um, I'll have the integral from 0 to pi over 4. And then when I simplify this, my 2 squared will be 4 times the other 2, so I'll have negative 1 8. And instead of writing this as 1 over cosine squared theta, just thinking a step or two ahead to my integration, that is the same thing as secant squared theta, which is a basic antiderivative, you know, from Calc 1. And then here I'll make this plus 1 half. And then instead of writing this as 1 over secant squared theta, I will rewrite that as cosine squared theta, which is not a basic antiderivative, you know, but you can use a double integral, double angle, sorry, double angle identity to finish that integration. All right, so you should know that double angle identity. We did some review of that at the beginning. Just to save some space here, I'm going to go ahead and actually just write down those antiderivatives, and then we'll plug in our limits of integration. Okay, so I'll have a minus 1 eighth. Antiderivative of secant squared theta is tangent theta. And then I'll have a one-half, and then I'll have a, another one-half times another one-half from that double angle identity. So I'll have a plus one-fourth. And then here, this double angle identity, I will have a one plus cosine two theta. Integrating with respect to theta will give me theta plus one-half sine two theta. All right, so if you need to write out that integration, you can do that. That's Calc 1 integration, but it's okay to write that out. It's better to write that out than to get it incorrect. Uh, all right, and then I need to go ahead and plug in my limits of integration here to all of this. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll have minus 1 8 times tangent of pi over 4. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1 plus 1 fourth times pi over 4 plus 1 half times sine of 2 times pi over 4 is sine of pi over 2, which is 1. And then I'm going to subtract, put in 0 for all of this, minus uh, negative 1 eighth times tangent of 0 is 0, plus 1 fourth times 0 is 0, uh, plus 1 half times sine of 2, sine of 0, which is also
zero. All right, so all of this ends up being zero. Um, here I have a negative one eighth, and when I distribute this out here, I'll have a positive one eighth. Uh, so all I'll be left with here at the end is pi over 16. All right, so thinking about what this number means, this is the total value of this function on this region. So if we go back and think about those Riemann sums that we did when we built with Legos, think about you partition the region, pick a point in each element of the partition, plug that point into the function, get those function outputs, times size of the partition, add those all up, take the limit as the norm of that partition approaches zero, that's what this number represents. So again, you should be able to look at this and say, I expect that this number is going to be positive. No matter what numbers I put in for x and y here, this function will never have negative outputs. And so I'm going to think about adding up all of the outputs of this function on this region. No matter what the region looks like, I should expect that I have a positive number here because this function never has any negative outputs. It only has outputs that are zero or bigger. The other thing I should expect here, if I add up these function outputs on this particular region, is that I get a fairly small number, fairly close to zero. The farther I get away from the origin, the smaller the value of this fraction will be. So when I'm adding up points that are farther from the origin, rather than points that would be closer to the origin, I'm going to expect that these function output values are pretty close to zero. Right? As I plug in points over here, I'll get pretty small numbers here on these function outputs. So I'm going to expect not only that I get a positive answer here, but when I look at the region, because it's away from the origin, I'm going to expect that these, the sum of these function output values on this region will be a fairly small number. So this is a pretty reasonable number for that. You want to always think about that every time you do these. And the other thing that you want to think about when you do these, and especially as we go on into the content later and we use double integrals, Sometimes you might be able to look at an integral on a particular region and know what the answer should be by thinking about symmetry or geometry. And that's a perfectly legitimate shortcut that you want to be able to take. You want to be sure that you're thinking about it correctly. This answer is not the area of the region. You can find the area of this region and verify that it is not pi over 16, but thinking about the sum of the function outputs on that region. All right, we'll look at some more videos where we look at double integrals and then pretty soon triple integrals.